in the civil matters as well if your case meets certain criteria then you can go from the high court to the supreme court so supreme court does have appellate authority or appellate jurisdiction on all these matter over the decisions of the high court i hope you would have understood but as far as this writ issuing power of the high court in relation to the violation of fundamental right is concerned high court can refuse to issue the writs for the enforcement of fundamental right because let us see why because the high court's writ issuing power has been mentioned in article 226 and mind you article 226 is not fundamental right at times you would have seen media trials ongoing right cases sub judice and media starts discussing so those media trials again on the sub judice uh, cases are nothing those are interference those can be considered although these media trials have become a new normal so again i am repeating that there are certain qualifying criteria that a case must meet if that case wants to go from high court to the supreme court hello everyone so this is the third video in series of our discussion on supreme court if you remember in the first video we had discussed in length about the appointment process of supreme court judges that how the appointment process of supreme court judges has evolved over a over a period of time what was the appointment process until 1993 so you had executive huge executive role until 1993 and in 1993 you will say you had the second judges cases in which collegium system was evolved by judiciary itself which was consolidated further in 1998 by including two more judges or by you can say or by expanding the size of collegium in 1998 and until then you have this appointment of supreme court judges through the collegium uh, system right judges are appointing judges themselves so what happened in 2014 you had this 99th amendment act through which a new body was uh, brought out by executive in which you had this executive involvement as well in appointment of supreme court judge but that body called national judicial appointment commission was invalidated by supreme court in 2015 without any a single meeting right so how this process of appointment had evolved so we had taken around one or one and half hour rather right so we had detailed explanation so that was the scope of the first video in second video we discussed about the removal of supreme court judges what is this acting chief justice what is this retired judges what is this so all these things we already have discussed in previous two videos let us see what is the scope of this third video so in this video we'll discuss power and jurisdiction of supreme court of india right and while discussing the powers and jurisdiction of supreme court of india we'll discuss the powers and jurisdiction of supreme court of india under these verticals right so what is this writ jurisdiction of supreme court of india then what is this court of record then what is the original jurisdiction of supreme court of india which all cases come under original jurisdiction of supreme court of india which what are the power that has been given to the supreme court under this article 129 that comes uh, with this court of record then what is the appellate in which all cases supreme court does have appellate jurisdiction then what is the advisory jurisdiction to the supreme court and then uh, judicial review powers of the supreme court and in the last vertical you will see that we will discuss as has been our tradition the mcqs right so that is the scope of this video and uh, we'll take around one or one and a half hours in discussing this supreme court so this is the third video in the fourth video there are something called other parts of the supreme court right all the parts we are discussing here itself but the other parts right after uh, discussing these things writ jurisdiction courts of record original jurisdiction appellate jurisdiction advisory jurisdiction and judicial review power i don't think that we'll have the space so what i have done is the other parts of the supreme court we'll discuss in the next video thereafter a few other topic miscellaneous topic of the supreme court uh, will remain pending that we'll discuss in the fourth video right so uh, four videos uh, in the fourth videos you can expect that this supreme court chapter will be over right? so i hope the scope of the video would be clear to you let us discuss under what all verticals we have to or what is the jurisdiction of supreme court right so we'll study first what is the rate jurisdiction of the supreme court then what is this court of record what part supreme court does have under this court of record then in what all areas supreme court 
enjoy the original jurisdiction right what is the meaning of original jurisdiction what is the meaning of appellate jurisdiction and in what all area supreme court does have appellate jurisdiction then what is this advisory jurisdiction under this advisory jurisdiction supreme court is going to advise some people or a particular constitutional functionary so which constitutional functionary supreme court will be advising under this advisory functions of the supreme court then what is this power of judicial review and the other powers as i told other powers we will discuss in the next video right so under these many verticals under these six verticals right we will discuss whole of this video right so out of these six verticals we already know these two verticals right so what is this writ jurisdiction and what is this power of judicial review when we were discussing the part 3 that is fundamental right of indian constitution right we had already discussed when we were discussing this article 32 so under article 32 you have uh, this writ jurisdiction so supreme court can issue writ uh, to individual and organization right for the enforcement of fundamental rights right and as far as this power of judicial review you have this article 13 in indian constitution of part 3 right from where supreme court derive its judicial review power so these two we already have studied but we'll discuss in this video as well so the major focus of this chapter will remain or this video will remain these a uh, court of record original jurisdiction of supreme court appellate jurisdiction of supreme court and advisory although advisory jurisdiction as well when we were discussing this precedent chapter right so in that portion when when we were discussing the precedents part so there we already if you remember right and if you have been following this series regularly you will find that there is something called article 143 in indian constitution which deals with the advisory jurisdiction of supreme court right so these three things we already have discussed previously as part of our discussion in precedent and as part of our discussion on fundamental right right although we'll discuss all this stuff right you need not to worry but I, as a revision major i was just trying to give you an idea right so i hope these points would be clear to you let us first discuss that what are the articles that are related with these jurisdiction or these parts of the supreme court right and thereafter we'll get into we'll take these things one by one right so let us first see what are the articles related with these things so as i already told you that there are two articles there are two parts of the supreme court that you do have you will find in part 3 of indian constitution as only right so in part 3 you have these two article if you remember right we had discussed that part 3 spans from article 12 to article 35 right so article 13 and article 32 are from this part 3 of indian constitution which deals with fundamental right so power of judicial review as i already told you of the supreme court is driven from this article 13 although this word judicial review has not been clearly spelt out anywhere not even in article 13 in indian constitution but implicitly we'll discuss that how implicitly uh, this uh, judicial review power of supreme court is hidden in this article 13 right then this writ jurisdiction we'll see in the next slide itself what is this writ jurisdiction that is mentioned in article 32 right Uh, then uh, article 143 that talks about advisory jurisdiction right we already have discussed right so these three articles you can easily recall now about these five articles so let us discuss these one by one right so these articles you can e easily remember because these articles are in continuation right you have article 129 you have article 31 you have article 132 you have article 133 and then you have article 134 right so out of five article that i was talking about right these three articles deal with the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court what is the meaning of appellate it is related with the appeal right we'll see when we will discuss the uh, appellate jurisdiction of supreme court we'll see what is the meaning of appellate right so there are three articles article 132 33 and 34 right that is dealing with the appellate jurisdiction of supreme court right so supreme court the meaning of appe appellate is that supreme court in these cases in constitutional matters in civil matters in 
क्रिमिनल मैटर सुप्रीम कोर्ट कैन बी अप्रोच बाई वे ऑफ अपील राइट तो विल डिस्कस देर आर थ्री आर्टिकल दैट इज डेडिकेटेड टू द एपेलेट जुरिस्टिक्शन ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट आर्टिकल वन थर्टी टू आर्टिकल वन थर्टी थ्री आर्टिकल वन थर्टी फोर देन आर्टिकल वन थर्टी वन डील्स विद द ओरिजिनल जुरिस्टिक्शन वट इज द मीनिंग ऑफ ओरिजिनल विल डिस्कस दैट एज वेल राइट देन आर्टिकल वन ट्वेंटी नाइन दैट डील्स विद Court of Record under this Article 129, Supreme Court does have two powers. We'll discuss that as well. So let us revise it. So you have Article 13 and Article 32, right? Power of judicial review and writ jurisdiction. Article 129 deals with Court of Record. Article 131 original jurisdiction. Then Article 132, 33, 34 deals with appellate jurisdiction of Supreme Court. And then finally you have Article 136 that deals with special leave petition. And Article 143 deals with advisory jurisdiction of Supreme Court. So I hope these articles you would be able to recall, right? Although this is an additional burden that I am putting you, right? A normal UPSC aspirant. need not to remember but i want you not to be normal not to remain normal if you want to take edge over other people and uh, as i already have told you right upsc is a competitive exam and until and unless you don't uh, develop this habit of taking competitive edge and these are the areas where you can take the competitive edge right so if you cannot remember no issues but if you can remember right that would be good enough right so i hope these articles you just one once or twice if you could go through these articles you would be able to recall and that's why i have organized this in this fashion right let us recall it one uh, once again article 132 133 134 continuous article right that deals with appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court then the previous article that is article 131 deals with original jurisdiction right so four articles you can easily remember these two articles article 13 and article 32 right if you don't remember here you will have to remember it in fundamental rights section so this will be a repetition in fundamental rights section as well and in the supreme court's par section as well so these two article even if you don't like right you you will have to remember rather by repeated study right you would be able to recall these two articles as well the additional article again this 143 as well uh, your mind will be subjected to the repeated studies because you will have to recall this in precedent chapter as well you will have you will have to read this in precedent chapter as well and you will read this in uh, supreme court chapter as well right so these two article this article right so these three articles any way you have to read about these four articles original jurisdiction 131 132 130 133 130, and 134 these four articles right these are continuous right so 131 original jurisdiction 132 33 34 right appellate jurisdiction and one additional article that you need to remember that is 129 that deals with the court of record right so i hope all the articles you would be able to recall now let us move to the next slide and let us discuss first we'll discuss this what is this writ jurisdiction i would have like to discuss this in continuum but this power of judicial review due to some reason has been put up on the last slide right so the sequence is like this first we'll discuss this what is this writ jurisdiction what is this court of record thereafter it will be in continuity right so this is the only thing that has been put up in the last and thereafter in continuation so let, let us first discuss what is this writ jurisdiction so writ jur jurisdiction of the supreme court we already have discussed when we were discussing this uh fundamental right so in fundamental right if you remember we already had discussed right that it is supreme court which is considered as protector and guarantor of fundamental rights of the citizen now if supreme court is said to be guarantor and protector ultimate protector although for the enforcement of uh, fundamental right you can go to the uh, high court as well and supreme court both right but this is the only area where you can directly approach supreme court otherwise you have something called this hierarchical function hierarchical uh, judiciary where you have this subordinate courts right then you have this high court and then finally at the tip of this pyramid you have this supreme court right so in civil matters or in criminal matters you will have to follow this hierarchy right but this fundamental right is the only section where you can go directly 
to the Supreme Court because of the sacrosanct nature that fundamental or because of the huge importance that this fundamental right does have in this uh, liberal age, right? And that is the reason why this option has been given uh, to every citizen of India that as soon your fundamental right can be, uh, it has been violated, right? You need not to wait to follow this uh, hierarchical structure of this uh, judiciary, right? You can directly jump to the Supreme Court and can ask that, hey, you are the guarantor, you are the ultimate protectors of our right, right? And my fundamental right has been violated. Now come and rescue me, right? So when this Supreme Court has been given this huge role of protecting and guaranteeing fundamental right of every citizen, and in some case, foreigners as well, then they need to be given, they need to be equipped with huge amount of equal amount of powers as well, right? And that's why they have been given, the Supreme Court has been given something called writ issuing power, right? So, writs are nothing, the meaning of uh, dictionary meaning I am not getting, right? Because we already have, uh, as I told that we already have discussed this writs, right? So, dictionary meaning I am not getting, as of now just uh, writ you can understand order, right? So, writs are nothing, orders uh, from the Supreme Court, right? So, these are the or writs, other meaning, other straight meaning you can take as whip, right? So, writs are nothing, whips or stick that has been given to the Supreme Court and these are the type of five type of sticks or writs that Supreme Court and this word whip, this word order or stick that I am using, those are nothing but lame words, right? Just to explain you the meaning of writ, right? So, Supreme Court has been equipped with these five kind of writs. So, these five kind of writs Supreme Court can issue when fundamental right of any citizen or foreigner has been violated, right? So, what are the kind of writs that Supreme Court can issue? So, you have this heaviest corpus, you have mandamus, sartoroi, prohibition and quo warranto, right? Again, I will not get into the explanation that what is the meaning or exact meaning of heaviest corpus, what is the meaning of prohibition, what is the meaning of sartoroi, what is the meaning of mandamus or what is the meaning of quo warranto that you will have to see in the fundamental rights chapter, right? So, Supreme court as soon any complaint has been received from any person uh, in the Supreme Court that their fundamental right has been violated depending on what fundamental right has been violated Supreme Court will issue any one or uh, many of these writs and will suggest concerned individual or concerned organization to take actions right the only difference between this uh, writ jurisdiction, uh, we were discussing that High Court and Supreme Court, right? Both does have power to issue the writs, right? For the enforcement of fundamental, right? Although our focus in this chapter is on writ juri uh, issuing power of the Supreme Court only under Article 32, but under Article 226, right? HC High Court as well does have power to issue writ for the enforcement of fundamental rights, right? So, why don't you move to the High Court or why did you move directly to the Supreme Court? Because of the importance that has been attached to the fundamental rights, right? So, you need not to follow as I told you that you need not to follow this hierarchical structure. The only difference between the writ jurisdiction or writ issuing power of the High Court and Supreme Court is that uh, High Court can issue writ for the enforcement of fundamental right as well and for the enforcement of other legal right as well. While Supreme Court has been given power only to issue writs for the enforcement of fundamental right only, right? It cannot, Supreme Court cannot issue writs for enforcement of any other legal right. So, that is one difference and that is why it is called that the writ jurisdiction or writ issuing power of the High Court is wider than the Supreme Court because Supreme Court can issue writ only for the enforcement of fundamental right while High Court can issue writ for the enforcement of fundamental right as well as legal. So, that is one comparison that we have done here that the writ jurisdiction of High Court is higher or wider than the writ jurisdiction power or writ issuing power 
of the supreme court let us read it writ issuing power of the supreme court is not exclusive but concurrent with the high court what is the meaning we already have discussed what is the meaning of this concurrent with the high court so high court as well can issue the this writs and supreme court as well can dis, uh, issue this writs and that is the meaning that uh, the writ issuing power of supreme court is not exclusive but it is concurrent means it shares this power writ issuing power with the high court supreme court can issue writs only for the enforcement of fundamental right and not other legal rights while high court can issue writs for the enforcement of legal right as well and for enforcement of fundamental right as well and that's why it is said that the writ jurisdiction of high court is wider than the supreme court so i hope what is this writ jurisdiction of supreme court and the comparison of writ issuing power of supreme court with the high court you would have understood let me again repeat it that the writ is, uh, jurisdiction of supreme uh, court has been discussed in article 32 while the writ jurisdiction of high court has been discussed in article 226 the writ jurisdiction of high court is wider if than the writ jurisdiction of supreme court right because high court can issue writs for the implementation of normal legal right as well that is not the case in uh, for the supreme court so i hope this writ jurisdiction you would have understood let us move and discuss the next power of the supreme court right so under the, the same category sc cannot refuse to issue writs for the info so this is the new information under this vertical that is writ jurisdiction as uh, itself right the, the supreme court cannot refuse to entertain writs right so when you are moving to the supreme court right and asking so and so fundamental right has been violated right if you remember the uh, hierarchical structure right so if you are moving to the supreme court and if you are citing violation of any of the fundamental right and if you are suggesting supreme court or rather if supreme court feels that i need to issue the writs right they will have to issue the writs they do not have any option but as far as this writ issuing power of the high court in relation to the violation of fundamental right is concerned high court can refuse to issue the writs for the enforcement of fundamental right because let us see why because the high court's writ issuing power has been mentioned in article 226 and mind you article 226 is not fundamental right why the, the writ uh, issuing power of supreme court has been mentioned in article 32 and article 32 is what fundamental right right and that's why this writ issuing power or writ from the writ issuance right supreme court cannot deny because the writs issuing power has been given to the supreme court under article 32 and article 32 is fundamental right and supreme court being ultimate protector and guarantor of the fundamental right they cannot refuse to issue the writs for the enforcement of fundamental right while that can be done by the high court so that is the information that sc supreme court cannot refuse to issue writs for the enforcement of fundamental right under article 32 because article 32 itself is a fundamental right right but high court can refuse to exercise its writ jurisdiction for the enforcement of fundamental right right so this is the all information about the writ jurisdiction of supreme court and writ jurisdiction of the high court right so the writ jurisdiction we have studied let us move to the next slide and let us discuss this what is this court of record or what is what power supreme court has been assigned under this court of record so let us recall what is the article related with this court of record article 129 so let us move to the next slide and let us discuss this court of record right so this is your article 129 we will not read this so let us see what power that supreme court has been empowered with under article 129 that is court of record right so there are this is your article 129 we will not read this we will take the shortcut right there are two kind of power that article 129 equips supreme court with right so what are these two powers the, so the first power is that the judgments of supreme court can be used as precedent by the other courts right so what is the what is this precedent so precedent is nothing example or you can say reference 
right although we'll discuss these things in detail in the next slide so the judgment can be used as example by the other courts other courts when i am saying i am referring as high court and subordinate court so suppose uh, supreme court has given a landmark judgment suppose in 1971 in a murder case where it took completely exceptional view right so the same exceptional view and when i am saying exceptional view it may be deviation from a normal law we'll see the examples right so what can happen means in 1971 some judgment in a particular case was taken by the supreme court supreme court gave some observation on that particular case of murder now what high court and supreme court can uh, sorry subordinate court can do that in 2020 itself uh, as well right they can take a reference that because supreme court had say so and so in that particular case we are also following the footstep because the nature of case that as a subordinate court just today i am looking into right so the nature of case that supreme court looked into back then in 1971 is same so the observation that supreme court made or whatever uh, steps that supreme court did follow we are following the same right so we'll discuss these thing this thing in detail what is the second part that article 129 equips supreme court with so the second part is that supreme court does have power to punish for its contempt so under this part supreme court can punish individuals as well as organization if these people uh, indulge in insulting meaning of contempt is insulting what kind of insults it may be right we'll discuss in the course of this video right so it does have power to protect its own integrity to protect its own independence protect its own sanctity right it does have power that it can punish individuals and organization we'll have a detailed look on these two things so let us first pick this judgment can be used as precedent by other courts and thereafter we'll discuss power to punish for its contempt right so i hope what is this article 129 dealing with so article 129 is dealing with these two things the supreme court shall be court of record right and shall have all the powers of such court including power to punish for contempt of itself right so that was article 129 i just broke this article 129 for your easiness in this two sections right so let us first discuss this first section that what is the meaning of court of record or what is the meaning of judgment can be used as reference by the other courts and thereafter we'll deal with that what are the parts that supreme court does have or what kind of cases supreme court can punish and what class of people what class of organization supreme court can punish for its contempt right so let us move to the next slide so you have this first thing judgment can be used uh as precedent by other courts right so decision of supreme court does have evidentiary value and can be used by subordinate courts as premise for their judgments sc supreme court's decision does have uh, can be used as legal references as well right so if you would have seen the chambers of the supreme court so here you do have famous lawyer kapil sibal now forget this personality as of now he is a famous uh, senior advocate in the supreme court uh, supreme court right if you see in the background and rather not his background alone right in supreme uh, any judge chamber if you visit right you would have seen these list of uh, libraries of this black books now what these books are are these the graduation book that they had read during their graduation or post graduation or during their doctorate no they are already bored by reading those books so they would never like us they would never like to keep this treasure trove of their their graduation or post graduation books right so those are nothing these books are nothing these books are judgment of the supreme court in various landmark judgment that supreme court does have delivered now why they will have these books why they will have to remember all these supreme court judgments because these supreme court judgment as i already told you does have evidentiary value right what is the meaning of evidentiary value so suppose if they are fighting uh, for their client in high court or their client in subordinate court right and if the case that they are fighting is of similar nature that i already told you that on which supreme court had already given its observation suppose in 1971 or 
AT, right? So he can quote that case that hey, whatever means to that subordinate court judge or to high court judge, right? They can cite that particular Supreme Court judgment, and if high court or Supreme Court is deviating that uh, taking the decision contrary decision which is not helping uh, this uh, advocate's client the Kapil Sibyl's client right then he can cite judgment of Supreme Court taken long back right that was reserved in this book right just a moment so he can cite uh, any of the case and can say that uh, similar nature of case has already been looked by the Supreme Court back then in 1981. So, the judgment that you are taking is completely abnormal and you should follow that particular line that was taken by the Supreme Court. And let me tell you in addition to all these things, there is something called article 141 and article 141 directly says and this is of Indian constitution. So, it directly says that the observation or the judgment of Supreme Court's observation or judgments of the Supreme Court becomes law for these lower courts that is high court and sub, uh, subordinate courts. So, that becomes law whatever observation or whatever judgment that Supreme Court does deliver right. So, Supreme Court judgments are reserved in these books right. So, whatever judgment that Supreme Court is delivering that will be saved saved right for the perpetual memory in these kind of books right so whenever these people are going to uh, fight any kind of case in high court or supreme court they'll browse all the books right they'll try to find out similar nature of case that supreme court if in past has looked into what was the observation on different aspect of that case by the Supreme Court and they can use that as legal reference, they can cite the reference that on that particular aspect, this is how means, this is how they have treated clients, this is how they have treated, means Supreme Court in that particular case treated the witness, right. Uh, this is how on this point they deviated from the law, right? They did not for the sake of natural justice, they did not follow the law, they provided some kind of concession. Right. So, that is what I was talking about that under this court of record as a court of record judgment can be uh, Supreme Court does have evidentiary their decisions does have Supreme Court does have decisions sorry decision of the Supreme Court does have a evidentiary value they can be used as premise for their judgment means subordinate courts that is high court and subordinate court can use their judgment supreme court judgment as a premise for their own judgment right sc decisions are legal so from court's perspective or from judges perspective judges of the subordinate court and high court perspective right judges can use these judgments uh, as a premise for their judgment and if the lawyer has to use right he or she can use as a legal reference right I hope the point would be clear to you let us take another example so this is a steal from the Bartla house encounter I don't know how many of you have seen this movie so this is a movie based on an encounter that was done in this Delhi area in Bartla house in 2018 uh, 2008 rather and here you have uh, this hero and here this person is arguing against the police team right here you do have judge and here you have all of the police team. So, here if I want to show you that how judges have taken or judges can take the decisions given by the Supreme Court as a premise for their judgment right. Let me show you rather a steal from the movie itself that I have kept for you right. So, here just a moment. So, here is the scene of the movie right, let me play it for you right. So, here you will see that judge will cite a particular case that Supreme Court had taken long back and citing. So, generally it is believed, generally you will see that the police statement, the statement given by police is not taking, taken as a, not considered as a witness right. Because uh, police itself is a party in crime and it in this case rather police was being implicated that police uh, did a wrong encounter or police falsified police implicated those four or five students right so police was a party in this case right so police was already implicated but in this case what uh, this judge uh, in the session court what he is going to do is that he will say that because uh, Supreme Court had taken a decision in so and so year and in that case 
they had taken the statement of an honest officer as witness so i'll also consider whatever statement that this john abraham he was a very decorated officer he had this six presidential medal right so he considered that whatever there were although there were other forensic evidence as well to back the claim by the police but uh, those claims were not sufficient and in that situation judge uh, deviating from the normal so normally the tradition is that whatever police says poli uh, police is not believed so in this case police was believed the statement given by the police was believed citing a case in which supreme court had also believed a statement given by a honest police officers officer so let us see the steal from that movie itself let me play it for you i'll be muted let me play state versus dilshad ahmed ke mamle mein Court Ahir Raja Khima versus State of Saurashtra AIR 1956 SC 217 का एग्जांपल देना चाहती है, जहां एपेक्स कोर्ट ने माना कि एक ईमानदार पुलिस ऑफिसर की गवाही भी एक ऑनेस्ट सिटिजन जितनी एक्सेप्टेबल है। 25 जुलाई 2013 को फैसला आया, तो संजय कुमार और स्पेशल सेल के हाथ में। So here did Media or some. Here, did you listen to the observation by the judge? He was clearly saying that in 1971 or particular, I did not hear the year he was referring to, but he was referring to some Supreme Court observation that in so and so year, uh, Supreme Court had considered uh, the statement by a particular honest officer. So we are also considering the statement. Although again, I am saying that that was a deviation, and that's why that session court had to refer to that particular case that because Supreme Court. had also referred in that case so we are also uh, following the footsteps so i hope the meaning of what is the meaning of this judgment can be taken as precedent by other court would be clear to you let us move to the next slide and let us discuss this power to punish for its contempt right so under the contempt right the easy meaning i already have told you that the easy meaning of contempt is insult right so if any individual or if any organization is trying to insult either any judge if you are trying to malign the image of a judge if you are through writing or through editorial or through your uh, media trial right if you are indulging into the malignment of the image of a particular judge or criticizing unfairly any of the judgment by the judiciary then that can be categorized as contempt right so there are two kind of contempt when we'll see the nuances you will notice that there are two kind of contempt one is called civil contempt and another is called criminal contempt so what act a petitioner or what act a normal citizen like you or me or what act an organization will do that will be categorized as civil contempt and what act any organization or uh, individual will do that will be categorized as criminal contempt let us see that right so very first let us discuss what is this civil contempt and th thereafter we will be discussing this what is this criminal contempt so the first common point between these two is that the civil contempt and criminal contempt is regulated by something called or is mentioned in something called contempt co of courts act 1971 so what is this civil contempt let us see right so if you are disobeying any of the judgment any of the decree any of the writ any of the proceeding or any of the observation that has been given by any judge or any uh, court right if you are disobeying that then that can be categorized as civil contempt let us take an example so suppose if you have given me a check of 25000 for any of the damages that you have so suppose uh, you ran into my car right and it was completely your fault i went i dragged you to to the court and court asked you to pay 25000 to me uh, within 30 days 25000 within the 30 days now within the 30 days you did not pay me and i again went to the court right so it will be considered as contempt it can be considered not will it can be considered it ultimately depends on the discretion of that particular judge right so legally yes the judgment was given by the court judgment was given by that particular judge and judgment was that you need to pay 25000 for the damages that you have done to the my car and now you are not paying me in that time that was given to you so that can be taken as uh what you call the contempt of the court and court can punish you what punishment you can be meted out right we'll see that or if you are taking if you have 
uh, given any undertaking that in future so suppose if you are caught in a minor case and in minor case the judge allowed you to let go uh, gi after giving a warning and after taking this undertaking that okay in future you will not indulge in any so and so act now again you indulge in that kind of activity police caught you and produced before the court and this undertaking comes in the front of that particular judge that oh he has given he or she has uh, given this undertaking that he will not do any such so that can also be considered as disobedience of judgment of that particular court and that will fall under the category of civil contempt so enough of the example the caution only caution is that the disobedience or breach must be willful deliberate and intentional which essentially means that you had this paying capacity means whatever amount the 30k that you had been suggested by the court to pay me you had this paying capacity but you did it in a deliberate manner you did this you would have heard this willful default right so Vijay Malia was declared this willful defaulter means SBI was able to prove that he had all the money uh, that was required to pay the debts of the C SBI but they did not pay uh, the Vijay Malia did not pay uh, it willfully and finally the court certified Vijay Malia as willful defaulter right so whatever breach of the judgment that has happened right that should be willful deliberate and intentional then only you will be punished for the civil contempt by any measure if you will be able to prove that whatever amount that you had suggested so suppose if Vijay Malia is declared willful defaulter now right and if he is able to manage to prove that no it is because of lockdown that my financial flow has suddenly stopped right i had this huge much of inventory if this inventory had reached market i would have this flow of money and then i would have been the position to pay this SBI whatever dues that the SBI is claiming right I would have been the position now because of this lockdown whatever inventory right now I do have that cannot get into the market right and so I cannot pay to the SBI right so in that case he will not be classified as willful in that case his actions will not be called deliberate or intentional then he can get away uh, from this punishment that can be awarded by this judge uh, judge under this civil contempt so i hope this what is the meaning of civil contempt you would have understood so in 2019 when election was on heat right there was one nara that this person was giving that chokidar chor and in chokidar was in reference to the prime minister or you can say the politician uh, narendra modi right bjp took this into the case that uh, into the court that whatever this chokidar chore has right that's that is nothing but malignment of the image of our prime minister or our head of leader right Supre uh, supreme court gave the instruction to this person that whatever allegation that you are making that is completely baseless you, you do not have proof and in future means he this person gave an undertaking that yes in future i will not make this remark chokidar chore but he again uh, uh, made this remark in one of the rally and finally contempt of the court notice was issued by the supreme court in new delhi right so this is one example that of the civil contempt that had been issued against the famous leader Rahul Gandhi right the second power uh, sorry second category is criminal contempt right so criminal contempt is also regulated by this contempt of court act 1971 and what can be classified what acts can be classified as criminal contempt in the civil con uh, contempt we saw that the deceive disobedience of any order decree right any kind of direction any kind of undertaking right so that was being classified as a civil contempt the criminal contempt would be that if by any method of writing or if by any method of uh, media trial if any individual uh, on the panel of media right or if any media organization through publication or by broadcast if they are doing any of these three acts so what these three acts can be that if they are trying to scandalize or if any of their acts tend to 
scandalize or lowers or tend to lower the authority of the court then they that kind of contempt will be considered as criminal contempt and then you can be punished under this criminal contempt notice the second act would be <coughs> if any of your act prejudices or interferes or tend to interfere with the due course of any judicial proceeding then again uh, you will be punished for this criminal contempt of the court right let us see a few example first example was that any of your publication if tries to scandalize or tends to scandalize or lowers or tends to lower authority of any court so the first example would be so you would have heard the story of this young woman 28 year old safura jargar who has been arrested for the anti ca protest and she is right now in jail she is not being granted uh, what you call uh, bail by delhi session court right so four bail request has been made and perhaps charges are a little serious against means c perhaps through means this is a police claim again right i am not making any kind of claim so whatever this matter is sub judice so the police is making claim that by the method of speeches she provoked the crowd and this provoked crowd led to the delhi rioting right again uh, a young woman cannot be held uh, for the complete i mean she did not uh, cannot be held accountable for the complete riot but yes she uh, provoked few uh, members of the crowd like 50 or 100 so that is the charge that has been leveled by the police against this lady now there is two or three group of two or three uh, media organization or digital portal i have deliberately not taken the screenshot because the kind of claim that i am going to level right that can uh, invite legal claim on me right that's why i have not taken so i'll not label the name as well that which more media organization or which digital portal is doing that so in this case right now judiciary is not giving the bail right so police would have leveled some charges right and that would be have been put up in front of judiciary right judiciary considering whatever evidence that has been produced right if four times the bail request has been denied to this particular lady by the judiciary you need to believe judiciary see on the police you can make claim on the judiciary as well if you start labeling although you know, these are also human being right and they can also be um, prone to corruption or any kind of uh, pulls and pressure i am not denying it but if you start leveling accusation against every institution i don't think that we would have faith in any kind of institution right so you cannot see the motives in every act you started uh, uh, looking into the motive of the police that they are politically influenced they are against a particular community okay fine police can be prejudiced police can be uh, biased but judiciary has denied four bail request to this lady then there would be some prima facie evidence right let us wait means we often say even in political circle, uh, circles it is op often said that let law take the own course now two or three digital uh, media portals are continuously ranting that by repeatedly and the kind of word that they are using see by repeatedly denying the bail to young pregnant she is 4 months pregnant let me tell you so that is a factual information so by denying bill to young pregnant student so they are making nothing she is being made a soft hero right now by those two particular or two three digital media portal right by using these words young pregnant student delhi courts has allowed executive to run communal agenda at the time of bihar election and by writing continues i have taken just one heading off from that digital uh, portal right there are many such article that is being written to malign the image of the judge who is delivering the judgment in her particular case and they are just trying to uh, malign him in a manner to show that he along with the politician he is also communal right so in these cases this particular case what you are doing is that through the publication of these kind such kind of articles right you are scandalizing the court's decision or you are tend to scandalize or you are lowering the authority of the court right by these kind of article what was the second 
uh, allegation. So the second is that if any of your acts is prejudiced or interfere or tend to interfere with the due course of any judicial proceeding. So suppose if there is any case that is subjudiced, that is still pending into the court and court is yet to take means within although the proceeding is going on or suppose within two or three days the court is about to take the decision. What now you can do is, so suppose this anti-CAA protest was going on, right? You had this Sahin Bag moment and at the same time you had this uh, case of against the citizenship act ca into the supreme court being heard at the same time this protest is going on outside the courts whole over delhi and there is a situation of riot and in that situation courts are hearing this case now what is happening courts are also manned by the people like you and me right they are not made of steel or they are means they are also human so they can be prone to this pressure pressure coming from Sahin Bagh, pressure coming from other side means I am not accusing these people means maybe they were fighting for their own right. If they are thinking that they are uh, on the constitutional angle fine I am not claiming any of their there was claim from there was fight from other side as well right. So you had these two groups one was pro CA and another is anti CA. Now this protest if you are doing outside the court or any part of the country and if you remember right these protests were very severe in nature at that time and if these protests are leading to the riots right you can imagine the impacts or you can imagine the pressure that courts would be under while taking decision of any such act or any such incident right so these protests are ultimately protests from both sides are ultimately doing what interfering by putting a kind of pressure or there may be in uh, at times you would have seen media trials ongoing right cases subjudice and media starts discussing so those media trials again on the subjudice uh, cases are nothing those are interference those can be considered although these media trials have become a new normal and that's why courts are not taking cognizance because if courts starts taking cognizance of the media trial for every case be it's a 370 right so the case, uh, case uh, against this abrogation of 370 is in court and there is huge amount of media trial going on you have this leftist media who is appealing that this abrogation of 370 was wrong you have this rightist media organization who are saying no 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 whatever government did in 370 that is completely wrong that was just uh, uh, justice to the hin uh, historical injustices right so these media trials are nothing these media trials are interfering or tend to interfere with the due course of the judicial proceeding and these media trial if the court starts taking as I told that if court starts taking cognizance of the media trial in various cases right be it anti CA be it 370 be it triple talaq right. So ordinance has yet been passed that ordinance has been challenged into the Supreme Court Supreme Court is yet to take decision within next two or three days and media trial starts. So those media trials ultimately is nothing that can be construed as interference, right? So that was the explanation of second uh, point that if any of your act or any of the organizational act is prejudiced or interferes or tend to interfere with the due course of any judicial proceeding that will be considered as criminal contempt of the court and court can issue notice to that particular organization or that particular uh, individual that hey you are doing any of these activities and that is illegal and now you can be punished for this activity right. So I hope this point would be clear to you now what punishment if any person is indulging into any kind of such activity right what punishment if for the civil or uh, criminal contempt he or she can be meted. So these are the punishment right so punishment can raise from monetary fine of 2000 to the 6 months of the jail or both right. One important point is that the power to issue contempt notice lies only with the Supreme Court and High Court, subordinate court, right? Subordinate court at the district level, you will see 
right session court district court right so they do not have they have not been given because their judgment cannot be believed judgment when I, when i am saying right so they may take the call at times intentionally right against a particular media organization or against individually because see here you have uh, these organizations supreme court and high courts are meant by erudite people they are very well educated they do have huge amount of experience but wisdom because when you will see this contempt of court is nothing uh, in the next slide you will will discuss right it will start contempt of court notice right will start a debate between freedom of speech and this court's power right because ultimately when you are doing these kind of activities when judiciary is saying that by writing any articles you are scandalizing or you are tend to scandalize our image judiciary's image or judges image right what ultimately you are attacking into you are attacking into freedom of speech and freedom of expression of any person or any organization right you do your activity i have miss a writing if you are being influenced by the writing then your wisdom should be questioned right you are judge you are not a normal person right that you should be influenced by normal pulse and normal pressure or normal protest right you should not be influenced right you are erudite people you are intellect people right so you should not be influenced and if any of my just editorial or a piece of article is impacting you then that is nothing but and if you are punishing me for that editorial or for my any of opinion in any of the newspaper you are attacking my freedom of speech and freedom of expression right so that will start a debate <coughs> and that's why subordinate courts has not been given this power to issue this contempt notice that lies only with Sup uh, supreme court and high court supreme court can issue notice for the protection of interest of supreme court as well high court as well and any of the tribunal or subordinate court as well right so supreme court does have wide amount of power as far as contempt notice issuing power is concerned so they can let me repeat it they can issue this contempt notice for their own contempt for the high court's contempt for the subordinate's contempt subordinate court's contempt and for the tribunals as well as far as high court's power to issue this contempt notice is concerned they can punish only for their own and subordinates contempt they cannot issue for the tribunals contempt right punishment for the contempt we already have read this right this debate of freedom of speech uh, and the contempt of court i'm not getting into that how contempt of court is a evasion on the freedom of speech and media rights you will already get this pdf and there you can read because videos are unnecessary lengthening right i have seen there are channels who are making these videos on supreme court on three hours and four hours right uh, parliament they have finished within six hours or seven hours right we are taking to 11 hour 12 hour and people are not now showing much interest that's why i'm just trying to uh, reduce the level of analysis that we are doing and will be also more factual although wherever necessary we'll do the analysis as well but this level of analysis perhaps is not necessary and this will remain present in the pdf you can read it and if you could not understand these things right you can refer to me in the comment section i'll surely reply on that part i can guarantee you that uh, i'll not protect myself i'll not say that i do not have time or anything right so that kind of excuse would be given but as of now we are just leaving it right so what debate that contempt of court and freedom of speech generates right that we are leaving how what is the origin of court of contempt power so origin is in modern england again this is not necessary but from mains angle if you could read right uh, it would be useful for in essay as well right or in main sense writing as well so what is what in what situation this court of contempt uh, court's contempt power came into the existence right now uh, the england where it does have origin right england have when is this court of contempt power they do not their courts do not have this power to issue this contempt notice right so to the executive executive does have this tool called sedition against the sedition they start 
taking the actions against the individual and that is encroachment on the fundamental right similarly on the similar line judiciary does have this contempt notice power to issue contempt notice and that is again nothing that is uh, attack on freedom of speech freedom of expression 191a right and in 191a you will see that your freedom of speech has been curtailed on this ground right so that is an exception that is mentioned in 191a itself that freedom of speech is legally curtailed right on the ground of core contempt power right so your freedom of speech is limited by this point right so how to connect all these points right this is available on the pdf again right you can see this so i hope this power of the supreme court would be clear to you let us move to the next slide and let us discuss other parts of the supreme court right so the writ jurisdiction under article 32 we already have covered now the court of record under article 129 we just finished now under article 131 right this is the original jurisdiction let us start discussing this original jurisdiction of supreme court so that has been discussed in article 131 so we do have this original jurisdiction of supreme court under article 131 so before we discuss that what are the cases that falls under original jurisdiction of supreme court let us discuss the meaning of two words that is original jurisdiction and exclusive jurisdiction so let us see what are the cases that will fall under original jurisdiction so the cases which can directly land into the supreme court those cases will fall under the original jurisdiction of the supreme court let me repeat it the cases which can directly land into the supreme court those cases will be called under the original jurisdiction of the supreme court so we do have this pyramidical structure of judiciary so at the uh, bases are uh, broad right and we do have tapered top right so the taper top because we do have only one supreme court below we do have these against every state we do have high court rather not against every state there are few state which do not have their own dedicated high court and and the base we do have this subordinate court right so this is the hierarchical structure that we do follow as the subordinate court right so when uh, generally the cases land into the uh, subordinate court thereafter if we are not satisfied then we go to the high court and thereafter appeal from the high court land into the supreme court so that is how our judiciary is designed right and that is why we call our judiciary integrated as well but there are certain cases which need not to follow this flow right they need not to go first this subordinate court thereafter high court and thereafter supreme court right so fundamental right that was falling under ju uh, writ jurisdiction that we had spelt into the uh, writ jurisdiction so if fundamental right is being violated right you can directly approach to the supreme court you need not to follow this hierarchical structure so fundamental right can also be called under the original jurisdiction of supreme court although we have another classification where we have classified fundamental right under under this writ jurisdiction of the supreme court but i was just giving you an example for the cases which can directly land so found fundamental right can directly land into the supreme court if it has been violated so it can be called that fundamental right falls under original jurisdiction but again the same caveat that we have put a fundamental right under the writ jurisdiction of the supreme court so i hope the dictionary meaning of this original jurisdiction you would have understood now let us discuss what is the meaning of exclusive jurisdiction so the cases which can fall or which can go only to the supreme court and cannot be entertained by any other subordinate courts like high court or any other subordinate court like session court or district court those cases or over those cases supreme court will have exclusive jurisdiction exclusive jurisdiction cases which can fall only or which can land only in supreme court i hope this point the meaning would be clear so what areas supreme court will have exclusive jurisdiction so if there is any fight between the federal units of the government what are the federal units so we do have union right and we do have state right so if there is any fight any feud between union state or state and state or if group of state and union then these kind of cases 
will land only into the Supreme Court. High Court and subordinate court does not have any jurisdiction if there is feud between the federal units of government that is state and union. And on these type of cases, you will see that Supreme Court will have exclusive jurisdiction. Although this word exclusive jurisdiction has not been mentioned in the, into the Indian constitution, Indian constitution does have mention of this original jurisdiction only, right? I hope the two meaning would be clear. Now let us discuss into the slide and let us start discussing what are the area where Supreme Court does have original jurisdiction, right? So if any case has to be transferred from one high court to another high court, right? Supreme Court can take call over. There is no other court that can take call over this, right? So what could be the reason where a case has to be transferred from one high court to another high court, right? So if uh, Supreme Court does have any legitimate reason to believe that a particular high court cannot deliver justice, justice in legitimate manner due to any kind of inter-political interference or administrative interference in that uh, cases supreme court can transfer case from one high court to another high court right so that falls under that power of supreme court falls under original jurisdiction of supreme court so if you see the pre uh, last year you had this unnao rape case where unnao rape case if you remember you had this involvement of uh, ruling party mla and he who happened to be very influential mla so on the petition of <coughs> so, on the petition of petitioner that uh, he happens to be very influential person, right? He did have capacity to influence the investigation as well and he did have capacity to uh, influence the judges as well. So, in that case, Supreme Court took the call and investigation you will see was transferred to the CBI and uh, this justic uh, adjudication of that case was transferred from Allahabad High Court to Delhi High Court, right? Here you do have this SC transfer, Supreme Court transferred all five cases related to Unnao to Delhi, asked CBI to finish probe in seven days, right? So I hope that point would be, the first point would be clear, right? Another case, if I take from the south, right, you had this late Jail Lalita. She happened to be CM, although I should not be involving this uh, late Saul into this discussion, but I did not have any other example. So, if you remember, friends from the south, if they remember, right, she was involved in that disproportionate case and that could not be resolved even until her death. So, she was CM of uh, uh, TN, Tamil Nadu, and uh, Tamil Nadu does have a dedicated high court that is in Chennai. So, Chennai court was not allowed to look into its case every time she had any hearing, she had to come into this Bangalore Karnataka High Court, right? And the extent her aura was such and why this was transferred from Chennai to uh, Bangalore Court? Because our friends from Tamil Nadu are politically very sensitive. Her political volunteer, whenever there was any hearing in Chennai High Court, right? they would create ruckus into the court itself and would try to build the pressure on judges. And we have already seen that uh, when we were discussing this court of record and contempt of court. So, in that case, we had discussed that uh, any person or any group, if they are trying to influence or if they are trying to uh, prejudice or interfere into the judgments of the court or judgment of the any judge right that will be considered contempt but that is something that 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 could not be how many contempt court notices you will issue so it was necessary considering the political influence that she wields because she was chief minister sometime ex chief minister as well so it was necessary and it was demand of justice as well that her case is transferred from Chennai to some another high court and finally the judgment was taken that it should be transferred to the Bangalore High Court. At that moment when her judgment was going on, right, I used to be in Bangalore, so I remember the route, whatever route that uh, her, uh, this convoy was to follow, that route was completely sealed and that would be filled with security personnel completely. On the day that whatever offices that route had, right, those offices would remain completely closed for the fear of being uh, right or the fear of uh, that political gundaism, right? <coughs> so that, <coughs> so that was the aura that she wielded, right? So, the first point of I hope 
the first jurisdiction or the first case where uh, Supreme Court does have original jurisdiction under Article 131 would be clear the second case. So, Supreme Court also can transfer any case from subordinate court, right? So, if there is any course case that is going in either in district court or session court. So, in that case, that case can be transferred from a subordinate court of one state to the high court of another state. So, that also comes under the original jurisdiction of Supreme Court, right? The third example, if I want to cite the third uh, case where Supreme Court does have original jurisdiction, the third case is that if there is any case. Uh, or if there is any parallel case in which Supreme Court is also looking into uh, and High Court of any other state or uh, one or more state is also looking into right in that case. So, suppose let me take an example. Suppose uh, there is a debate ongoing between uh, right to equality of women and right of religion of a group article 25 and article 26 that whether suppose sanctum sectorum debate that whether women should be allowed to enter into the sanctum sectorum of a particular temple suppose Sabri Mala in Kerala right. So, that debate is ongoing uh, into the Supreme Court the discussion is ongoing and the discussion is to happen for around one month. Now, another uh, case from any famous uh, what you call uh, temple of the UP merges up and the case is filed in Allahabad High Court right on the similar line where again the debate will start on article 25 of women versus article 25 and article 26 of that particular group that whether which should be given preference religious right of that particular group or right to equality of a woman similar nature. So, debate is going to be similar just geographical area is different here the debate is being generated into the Allahabad High Court. So, the constitutional question is same whether right to equality should be given primacy or right to religion of a particular group. So, because the nature of debate is going to be same in such cases high court uh, sorry Supreme Court does have power that they can withdraw these this particular case from Allahabad high court and can appropriate such case to the Supreme Court to itself can collect uh, such kind of cases and can have a single judgment on this matter if the nature of case is same right. So, that is the third case where Supreme Court does have original jurisdiction under article 131. Let me read it. If any case pending before Supreme Court concerning matter having pan India ramification or a question of law also pending before high court or high courts means of two one or more state right. Supreme Court can withdraw those cases before itself and settle it collectively. So, all these three cases we already have seen. Let us see what are other instances where Supreme Court does have original jurisdiction, right? So, if there is any feud or if there is any legal fight that is ongoing between federal units of our government, right? So, you do have center and state. So, if there is any legal fight that cannot be resolved at the political level, right? And if that lands into the court, so these kind of cases will land only into the Supreme Court. It cannot go either into high court or subordinate court, right? It cannot land into. And these kind of cases, let me tell you, are called exclusive jurisdiction of Supreme Court court exclusive jurisdiction and because this exclusive jurisdiction has not been mentioned into the constitution right we have put up this under original jurisdiction only right. So, in such kind of cases the jurisdiction of supreme court formally will be called uh, what you call original plus exclusive right because original because they can directly land into the supreme court and exclusive because it can only land into the supreme court i hope the difference would be clear so what kind of cases will be called or uh, what kind of fight or what kind of feud will fall under this category so if there is any feud between center and state over any legal matter if there is any feud between center and group of state if there is any feud between state and state and if there is any feud between state and group of state right so all these cases will fall under the original and exclusive jurisdiction of supreme court it can't go to the high court it can't go to the supreme coordinate court right. I hope this point you would have understood. So, recently you had 
Kerala government in uh, assembly of the Kerala government recently had passed a resolution against CAA. Once assembly had passed resolution against implementation of uh, Citizenship Amendment Act 2019, right? Thereafter, Kerala government decided to invoke this Article 131 and try to drag center into the Supreme Court citing that we will not, we are not going to implement CAA and mind you if any state refuses because this is a area on the citizenship center can bring the law right and if any state legally speaking states cannot refuse the implementation of any act that has been passed by the central uh, government and central government does have authority to make law on that particular. So, in such cases uh, uh, any state government cannot refuse. If state government are refusing uh, for the implementation of any uh, such act where central government did have actually central government was competent to make the legislation in that case central government can invoke this article 356 and can uh, have the precedent role, right? So, he because of political reasons, uh, the government that is ruling there, right? So, they do have the secular image or if they do not have that secular image, they had to make a political point, right? That we are very secular and we are the only the flag bearer of or uh, torch bearer of, of this secularism. So, to make that political point finally and to protect themselves from this 356, although there is no final judgment so far in the to the Supreme Court, right? So, to make that political point, to ma make that brownie point in front of this society, right? What they are in front of their voter, what they did is that they invoked this article 131 and citing this 131, right? They landed this case, uh, they made this case of center versus state, right? And went into what you call uh, Supreme Court, citing that we will not implement this. Uh, law called CAA. So, I hope the example would also be clear. Now, there are certain exceptions to the original jurisdiction of Supreme Court, right? So, when I was saying that uh, center and state or a state and state if there is any case, right, it can land directly into the Supreme Court and this kind of cases will be called under original jurisdiction of Supreme Court. Now, if you see a private, the exceptions are three. First exception is that private citizen cannot drag any state or union or state into the Supreme Court under the exclusive original jurisdiction of Supreme Court. So, you cannot, you or me, person like me cannot drag the state, any state or union or uh, state, group of states, right, into the Supreme Court under the original jurisdiction citing any kind of violation. So, does that mean that we cannot sue any state? No, we can sue any state. So, if we do have any kind of grievances, if I feel uh, that any of my right has been violated by the uh, state, so right now this corona is ongoing, right. And during those corona, I am a taxpayer citizen. If after paying tax and uh, I do not have any kind of means expectation from the, so far I did not have any kind of expectations from the state. As far as my education is concerned, I had from the private colleges, private school, and I, as far as my health was concerned, I took the private uh, insurance. Right now, the bare minimum that I am expecting is that if I do develop uh, symptoms of the corona, it should be tested by the state government and if state government does not have capacity, means I know, means uh, state government right now do not have capacity. So, if state government owing to the lesser capacity or reduced capacity or loaded capacity denied denies this uh, corona test to me, right, I can uh, and from my understanding, although my understanding or my opinion can also go wrong, but from my best of understanding, if I feel that it was my legal right and state does have obligation, certain obligation towards me considering that I do pay direct and indirect both kind of taxes, then I can sue the state. But if a private citizen is suing the state, that will not fall under the original jurisdiction of Supreme Court. So, what route I will have to take? So, I cannot sue the state government or central government directly into the Supreme Court. I will have to follow this hierarchical structure. That is the meaning of that private citizens cannot drag state or union or group of states under the original jurisdiction. The only meaning of original jurisdiction of Supreme Court is that 
यूनियन कैन नॉट बी ड्रैग और एनी स्टेट और एनी ऑफ द फेडरल यूनिट कैन नॉट बी ड्रैग्ड बाय अ प्राइवेट सिटीजन अंडर दिस ओरिजिनल जोरिस्टिक्शन ऑफ सुप्रीम कोर्ट राइट सो दैट वाज़ द फर्स्ट एक्सेप्शन सेकेंड एक्सेप्शन इज दैट क्वेश्चन ऑफ पोलिटिकल नेचर कैन नॉट बी एड्रेस्ड अंडर दिस जोरिस्टिक्शन लेट एस अंडरस्टैंड दिस सो सपोज इन राजस्थान Two months down the line, there is assembly election. Although it is scheduled three years later, but we are taking a hypothetical case. So suppose in Rajasthan there is uh, supposed to be assembly election. Now Yogi ji, uh, with his helicopter for a political rally, wants to land in Jaipur. But the Rajasthan government, uh, driven by ulterior political motive, does not allow. It directs its administration to cite any technical reason to the Yogi Ji's manager and ask that Yogi Ji ka jo helicopter hai, that cannot land into the Jaipur, citing some technical reason. Although the obvious reason was some political reason, because the Rajasthan government or the politicians of the Rajasthan ruling party felt that if Yogi Ji is allowed to do some political rally, he can influence uh, four or five assembly constituencies. so that that was the real real reason now yogi ji can do can do this route can take this route that oh i am the cm of uttar pradesh uh, and a cm of uttar pradesh has been denied entry into or his helicopter has been denied entry into the jaipur right so i'll sue uh, up will sue rajasthan no that cannot happen because the permission that was denied to you right that was due to the political reason right you were not landing there in capacity of cm try to understand although he is appears to be cm but when he was landing into the political rally he was more of a political party's leader than a cm of the state he was not representative he was not going as a representative of state right so that is the point that the question of political natures can't be addressed can not i guess right that word is missing cannot be addressed under this jurisdiction of the supreme court right yogi ji can drag rajasthan into court just because his helicopter was not allowed to land in jaipur for a political rally so this was second exception to this original jurisdiction of supreme court let us see the third jurisdiction third exception right so the third exception is that any provision in the constitution which excludes supreme court's jurisdiction by specifically mention mentioning sources so, so let us take another example right what does this mean right so suppose this is rajasthan and this is up there is a canal constructed for the irrigation and a mou is signed between up and rajasthan or agreement or a statute is signed between or a level of understanding is developed between up and rajasthan that whenever there is any amount of dispute between uh, about the water distribution will not go into the supreme court or supreme court or high court will not have any kind of authority what we will have is that we will have a governing body right where four ministers of yours and four ministers of our will sit and will amicably settle this issue right so here through this mou or through this written agreement this agreement has denied clearly that supreme court will not have any authority over this issue right so in this case because uh, the supreme court jurisdiction has been clearly or specifically uh, denied right so in this case supreme court will not have original jurisdiction even if federation state a uh, federal unit like states and states are involved i hope you would have understood so in constitution if you see you have this article 266 that deals with interstate water dispute right so for the resolution of water dispute this article has cre already created not article but parliament has already created a tribunal and tribunal will look into any issues that arises between different states upper riparian state and lower riparian states right so here as well you will see the original jurisdiction supreme court does not have original jurisdiction although you would have seen the cases landing related to the water dispute between karnataka tamil nadu between odisha and chatisgarh right so you will see that the cases lands into the supreme court but that is not by the original jurisdiction of the supreme court there is something called special leave petition that will discuss under article 136 when we'll discuss uh, this appellate jurisdiction so under article 136 there is something called special leave petition so under special leave petition states can go 
to what you call uh, Supreme Court, but as far as original jurisdiction is concerned, original jurisdiction of Supreme Court has been clearly spelt out by this article 262. So, I hope this original jurisdiction that has been discussed by uh, constitution under article 131 you would have understood. Now, we are moving into the next jurisdiction of Supreme Court that deals with the appellate jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. So, if you remember let us have a revision, we already have done writ jurisdiction. 32 court of record 129 original jurisdiction just completed 131 now we are going to discuss appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court so appellate jurisdiction of supreme court has been what is the meaning of appellate we'll have a look but appellate jurisdiction as far as article is concerned right appellate jurisdiction of supreme court has been discussed under these three article article 132 article 133 article 134 the next would be advisory jurisdiction that has been discussed under article 143 thereafter power of judicial review that has been discussed under article 13 right so these things we already have discussed now we are delving into appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court now what is the meaning of appellate jurisdiction first let us see so as i already have told you that we do have this hierarchical or pyramidal structure of judiciary in indian constitution right so here at the bottom we do have broad base and we, here we do have more number of subordinate courts right so if we are means traditionally it is felt although there are some traditional belief that i'll be breaking when we'll be discussing this uh, uh, appellate jurisdiction but uh, set this thing this this information that myth aside for a moment right so what is this let us first understand that what is this appellate jurisdiction right so here uh, how do we reach? So, if we do have a normal case, if there is a general case, first we go into the subordinate court. If we are not satisfied with the decision of the supreme uh, subordinate court, then we will go to the high court, right? We will appeal into the high court, right? And if we are not satisfied by the decisions of the high court, we will appeal into the supreme court, right? So, appellate jurisdiction appellate when you are writing right it is a derivation from the word appeal right so because we were not satisfied from the decisions of the supreme court we appealed into the high court and because we were not satisfied from the high court as well we appealed into the supreme court what does this essentially mean if you take a backward case right a backflow supreme court does have authority or supreme court does have appellate authority over the decisions of the high court right because if some person if some petitioner is not happy with the decision of the high court he does have option to go to the supreme court he does have option to appeal to the supreme court and from that word appeal this appellate has been made right so supreme court if i say in other words right other words right supreme court does have appellate authority over the decisions of the high court and similarly high court does have appellate authority over the decisions of the subordinate court right so the meaning at least would be clear to you that what is the meaning of appellate jurisdiction as far as the myth breaking i was talking about right so so far if you do not have a clear understanding that how the case case flow happens from this bottom to the up let us understand this although clearly we will understand in uh, next one or two slide but let us have a general understanding right so the traditional belief has been or the people who does not have understanding of law the traditional belief or rather i have been discussing in this video itself that if you are not satisfied with the decision of the subordinate court you can go to the high court if you are not satisfied with the decision of the high court you can go to the supreme court but let me tell you that this does not have uh, happen in all the cases it can't happen there are certain uh, cases nature will discuss right what nature of cases so there are certain type of cases that will stop here itself and unless those cases qualify certain criteria unless those cases meet certain criteria they cannot go from high court to supreme court does not matter what kind of decision high court has given so again i am repeating that there are certain qualifying criteria that a case must meet if that case wants to go from high court to the supreme court we'll see that so that is the myth that i was trying to break that every case cannot have a seamless flow from subordinate court to 
high, uh, the Supreme Court, right? It will have a break here and if that case uh, does have certain qualifying criteria, does fulfill certain qualifying criteria, then it would be able to break this flow and it would be able to go to the Supreme Court. We will have a clear understanding. So, the appellate jurisdiction of Supreme Court has been discussed, has been covered under these three articles, Article 132, Article 133 and Article 134, right? So, as far as uh, you do have, uh, Supreme Court does have appellate jurisdiction over the decisions of the High Court in three matters, right? You have this constitutional matters, just a moment, let me show you rather. So, Supreme Court does have appellate jurisdiction on the decisions of the High Court under these four categories. So, on the constitutional matter, if some judgment has been delivered by the High Court and if you are not satisfied and if your case meets certain criteria, certain qualifying criteria, then you can go to the Supreme Court against the decisions of the High Court. Then in the civil matters as well, if your case meets certain criteria, then you can go from the High Court to the Supreme Court. So, Supreme Court does have appellate authority or appellate jurisdiction on all these matters over the decisions of the High Court. I hope you would have understood. So, as far as constitutional, constitutional matters, appellate authority of Supreme Court under uh, for this constitutional matter is concerned that has been covered, that has been dealt in Article 132. Appellate authority of Supreme, appellate jurisdiction of Supreme Court in civil matters has been dealt in Article 133. Appellate jurisdiction of Supreme Court in criminal matters has been dealt in Article 134 and appeal by special leave. Although this cannot be called appellate jurisdiction of Supreme Court, it does have its own special feature. What are the special feature of appeal by special leave? Uh, a special leave petition, I will add one other word, special leave petition. In shorthand, it is also called SLP. So, it has been covered in Article 136. So, Supreme Court does have jurisdiction, appellate jurisdiction on all these matters, in constitutional matters, in civil matters, in criminal matters. Let me brief you ag again that the decisions of High Court in these three fields, in constitutional matters, in civil matters, in criminal matters, can be challenged into the Supreme Court, right? Supreme Court does have appellate authority in all these three fields. If if the, uh, these three cases, three type of cases meet certain criteria, meet certain qualifying criteria. Let us see what those qualifying criteria is, right? So, in constitutional matters, in constitutional matters, as I already told you that Supreme Court does have appellate jurisdiction and it has been dealt in Article 132. Two, right. So, in constitutional matter, High Court decision can be dragged into the Supreme Court and Supreme Court does have appellate uh, in Supreme Court and Supreme Court does have appellate jurisdiction provided means when can you drag uh, a decision of High Court in constitutional matter and when can you take this High Court decision into the Supreme Court as far as constitutional matters are concerned when High Court issues you a certificate. Right? When High Court says that the decision that I had taken or I wanted to take, it contains a substantial question. So, the key word is that the substantial question of law. Right? And if it says that it requires this case that this petitioner has brought, right? this case requires interpretation of the constitution. So, if the High Court gives you a certificate, gives the petitioner this certificate with mentioning these two kind of things, that this was a constitutional case that has been brought to us, to me, uh, to this High Court judge, right? And solution, if I want to deliver the judgment, right? I cannot deliver the judgment because it requires substantial question of law. There is a law that has been questioned, right? and has to be interpreted substantially, right? And it also requires interpretation of the constitution, which Supreme Court alone is impaired, although interpretation can be done by the High Court itself, but it will not have a pan-India value, right? And that is why if the High Court gives you a certificate, then you can approach the Supreme 
court right so in constitutional matter the appellate authority that supreme court does have is dependent on this issuance of the certificate by the high court i hope you would have understood right so here if the high court does not issue the certificate right there would not be seamless flow of the constitutional case that particular constitutional case it will break at the decision of the high court so whatever inter if the high court wants to interpret the constitution and if high court feels that they are equipped means uh, from wisdom point of view if they are equipped to uh, uh, this interpret that law as well then that does not matter how willing you are or how against you are the decision whether you like the decision of the high court or not if high court refuses to issue this certificate you cannot go to the supreme court against the decisions of the high court although there is one means i am not issuing a sweeping statement that you cannot go there is one route called special leave petition we'll discuss this in this video itself that is under article 136 that will if supreme court allows you this route again you cannot go to the supreme court as a matter of right and you cannot claim that hey high court has refused to issue this certificate now you allow me this road this is no this is discretionary power of the supreme court and supreme court will hear to you if they find that there is merit then only they'll allow you to appeal into the supreme court against the decisions of the high court right so that route is special leave petition we'll discuss that in detail right so the appellate authority uh, appellate jurisdiction of supreme court in the constitutional matter i hope you would have understood now let us move to the next slide and let us discuss the appellate jurisdiction of supreme court in civil matter so in this case as well supreme, if the high court does not issue you this certificate right mentioning these two point the first is the first point is same that it involves substantial question of law and question needs to be decided by supreme court we cannot decide means due to any reason if high court is ready to put this point into that certificate that question needs to be decided by supreme court right so in that certificate if they mention these two points and if they gives you this certificate then only you can go to supreme court against the decision of the high court otherwise in civil matters as well you will have to break here right you cannot cross again that exception article 136 that is special limb petition is always available but always available only when supreme court allows you right otherwise that civil matter without that certificate in absence of certificate will stop here itself means high court only in this case will be the final authority you will not be able to move from high court to supreme court in absence of this certificate right so in uh, civil matters as well you saw that supreme court does have appellate jurisdiction in civil matters as well right but that's that can be abrogated by if high court refuses to give you this certificate right i hope that point would be understood what about the criminal matters right so criminal matters has been appellate authority appellate jurisdiction of supreme court has been dealt in article 134 right in criminal matters right 132 133 and 134 right so in the previous case in constitutional matters in civil matters we saw that uh, high court needed to issue this certificate and then only you can move to supreme court right without this certificate you cannot could not go to the supreme court but in criminal matters there are two cases two instances where you can approach supreme court without this certificate as well what are those two cases the two cases are suppose i have been accused of a murder right somebody did accuse of a murder right i was produced in uh, investigated and thereafter you had the subordinate court which acquitted me right there were circ circumstantial evidence and on the basis of circumstantial av evidence the subordinate court found that i was not guilty and they acquitted me on a later stage suppose a year down the line or six months down the line or two months down the line the other party right appealed uh, in the high court right and the high court reversed the judgment right 
here in the high court i was found guilty and high court awarded me any of these three punishment if high court awards me this death or if high court awards me with this life imprisonment or if high court awards me incarceration greater than 10 years so in these three cases i can move to the supreme court against the decision of the high court in the supreme court against the decision of the high court right without having to obtain this certificate i hope the point is clear right so in these three cases right i was acquitted high court took the case high court after taking the case declared me guilty where i was acquitted by the uh, subordinate court and it awarded me uh, life imprisonment or death or jail term of greater than 10 years mind you greater than if it would have been less than 10 years then i would have to obtain this certificate but in this case if any of the three uh, uh, in any of the three conviction oh sorry sentence is awarded to me by the high court i can move to the supreme court without having to obtain this certificate right logic is why i will not have to obtain the certificate the log logic is that there is conflict in the judgment by the subordinate court and the high court subordinate co uh, court on the basis of same evidences acquitted me while the high court uh, sentenced me right so that is the reason why i will not have to have the certificate and i can directly approach the supreme court the second situation where again i will not require uh, this certificate the second situation is that okay in the first case i had been acquitted in the second case suppose in subordinate course uh, court my case is under trial i am in jail but i am under trial the final decision has not been taken by me now the high court does have authority that it can withdraw even an ongoing case from subordinate court to itself right so high court withdraw this case uh, from subordinate course where my case was ongoing to itself and it awarded me again any of these things either death or life imprisonment or incar incarceration greater than 10 years even in this case i do have right that i can move to the supreme court without having to obtain this certificate right and these in these two cases i can move to the supreme court as a matter of right okay there is third case as well in which i'll have to obtain the certificate and the third case is that if uh, super uh, high court due to any reason willingly issues me that certificate that yes this particular case is fit to be go into the supreme court right so in that case again i can so does not matter what uh, sentence I have been awarded so even if it is less than two years or even if it is less than three years and it is not qualifying any of these criteria but high court willingly issues me this certificate that yes this particular case is fit to go to the supreme court in that case I can but here it is not my right it has been this right this has been extended by high court right so i hope you would have understood that in civil matters in constitutional matters if you have to go to the supreme court right you need to have uh, that certificate but in criminal matters there are two situation in which uh, petitioner need not to obtain the certificate from the high court if he has been uh, through these if he has been awarded any of these three uh, sentences that is greater than 10 years life imprisonment or death in that case he can go to the supreme court as a matter of right right so i hope these three points uh, the appellate jurisdiction of the supreme court in the constitutional matter in the civil matter in the uh, criminal matter you would have understood there is one more area that is called appeal by special leave or alternatively it is also called special leave petition slp that has been dealt in under article 136 right let us discuss it so suppose in the constitutional matter and in the civil matter you saw that how did you uh, require this certificate from the just that how did you require this certificate 
from the high court right so a petitioner was completely at the mercy of uh, issuance of certificate from the high court right but if there is any case where the person or petitioner so suppose see i have not done the murder but the circumstantial evidence compelled the high court to deliver a judgment against me so i have been incarcerated for say 7 years right so i do not qualify any of the three criteria means uh, to be able to move to the supreme court without having to obtain this certificate i should be jailed for more than 10 years but now i have been jailed only for 7 years but for me because i have not done the murder and i know yes the for the world they will consider others they will consider uh, what you call judgment of the high court itself but for me i know that i have been uh, there has been a miscarriage of justice right and sev I cannot spend means seven years of my life in the jail without having done the murder right I cannot spoil my seven years in the jail so and because right now I do not have any way out as well right so what I can in such situation petitioner has been given the option right and that is entirely to serve the purpose of justice that is entirely to ensure that there is no miscarriage of justice by judiciary itself this route has been opened and that route is special leave petition under article 136 just to ensure that natural justice is served to everyone right so on the first go you put up this condition that okay certificate is needed and the logic behind this uh, certificate is that you want to miss judiciary want to stop cases at certain level right you cannot be miss every person if is given right uh, to move from subordinate court to high court then high court to the subordinate court right every time means both out of both the party one party will always be not happy with the judgment right and they will start moving from the, the this flow will never stop this flow will never be ending and you will ultimately see supreme court completely loaded with the cases right and that's why this certificate condition has been put up right they believed in the judgment of the high court and said that okay in certain cases this high court is going to be the final authority so that was the logic why this certificate condition has been put up but the certificate at the time that i gave my example where i had not done the murder but there were circumstantial evidence against me and i have been jailed incarcerated for seven years right so in such cases this certificate see certificate gave one advantage that it stopped the pile up of cases at the top but in my case justice has not been served to me so it is necessary that for to deal with the cases like me right this special leave petition has been given right so the purpose of or the objective of special leave petition you would have understood let us have uh, the theoretical meaning right so the special leave petition what is the special leave petition so special because this route can't be opted in usual circumstances right at times where justice might require supreme court's interference but case in question may not qualify so my case was not qualifying right i was incarcerated only for seven years right so i cannot move to the supreme court because of the previous condition in the criminal matter right so the where case may not qualify the appeal criteria so i was not uh, qualifying the appeal criteria to reach the sc and that's why you have this special leave petition if aggrieved is not satisfied with the judgment of the high court tribunal lower court he can ask for a special leave to file appeal against the judgment of high court and tribunal but mind you one thing that this special leave petition that is to be granted at the or the power that supreme court does have through this special leave petition right you cannot claim it as a matter of right because this is something that is discretionary power of the president what you will have to do is to in order to avail this facility in order to take this route to appeal your case you will have to brief before the judge of the supreme court and if judge finds the merit in this case then only he or she will allow you to take this special leave petition route so this is the discretionary power of supreme court and hence sc supreme court may refuse to entertain this case under this route it can't be claimed as a matter of right so i hope this point you would have understood now let us discuss other nitty gritty if supreme court allows petition will be submitted supreme court can deliver judgment against the order judgment or incomplete conclusion of any court or tribunal right so it does not matter whether it is high court subordinate court or any tribunal right supreme court 
can take any decision against any does not matter whether the final judgment has been given by the high court supreme court or tribunal even it can announce a judge, a order against the incomplete judgment of supreme subordinate court high court and tribunal as well but there is one exception and that exception is that any institution that has been created under this armed force act right and if any tribunal that has been created under armed force act right if that tribunal gives any kind of judgment right their uh, judgment cannot be challenged into to the supreme court using this special leave petition that is one limitation on the part of the special leave, uh, leave petition tool right so except those established under armed force acts right cases related to uh, interstate water dispute act article 262 so if you remember article 262 completely denies or it allows rather central government to deny authority of supreme court right so the uh, the act interstate water dispute act that has been created by the parliament it excludes the uh, original jurisdiction of supreme court right they clearly say that supreme court cannot look into the issue of interstate river dispute right so they have created one dedicated tribunal to look into the issues of the states upper riparian state and lower riparian state now if you see if you notice the right there is there are feuds between karnataka tamil nadu there are feuds between uh, odisha and chatisgarh right so those cases often land into the supreme court and how does it land when uh, this act had already clearly denied or excluded the supreme court's uh, original jurisdiction it is by special leave petition right because special leave petition says that sc can deliver judgment against the order judgment incomplete conclusion of any court or tribunal right so as soon it says that any tribunal right so the tribunal that has been created by article 262 right or, or not article 262 rather by this act this tribunal has been created right so that tribunal's decision can be challenged into the supreme court if supreme court allows the party to appeal using this special leave petition route right it is an exceptional power of the supreme court which should be used sparingly kabhi kabhi use hona chahiye in cases where principles of the natural justice has been violated right so i hope this a uh, special leave petition you would have understood now we are going to discuss advisory jurisdiction of the uh, supreme court that has been dealt into article 143 of indian constitution so as a revision measure again we have done this writ petition uh, writ pa issuing power of the supreme court article 32 court of record article 129 original jurisdiction article 131 appellate authority 130 132 133 134 then advisory jurisdiction article 143 power of judicial review article 13 right so let us start our discussion on advisory jurisdiction of the supreme court under article 143 so this advisory jurisdiction of supreme court we already have covered but from another angle right so when we were dealing with the president power right we had discussed this advisory jurisdiction of supreme court but there we had discussed it as a power of president but here we are discussing it from the angle of jurisdiction of supreme court advisory jurisdiction of supreme court so let us understand that what is the difference between power of president to ask the advice and what is the difference between uh, this advisory jurisdiction of the supreme court in article 143 although article uh, wahi hai par dekhne ka nazariya wahan president pooch raha tha yahan supreme court advise kar raha hai so there are two areas in which president can ask for the advice of a president can seek the advice of supreme court so what are the two areas the second area is that the president can seek opinion of supreme court in any case of any dispute arising out of any pre constitutional treaty any kind of pre constitutional agreement if it has been between the center state or state state if there is any kind of pre constitutional agreement or pre constitutional treaty in that condition uh, president can seek sc's advice right 
the first area is the first case where uh, president can seek supreme court's advice is that if there is any matter of fact or if there is any matter of law in that area as well and it is not only president uh, which can seek the advice so here if you see if i take the practical case in the first case it can be that there is any bill or there is any policy matter that has been presented by after passes of the Rajya Sabha and passes of Lok Sabha that has been president uh, that has been presented to the president for signing. In that case, president is not sure about the constitutionality of the act because uh, he is not a political science student, right? Uh, person like Kalam, right? He can be scientist as well, right? So it is not expected that he will be aware about the all constitutional expect. In that situation, what before signing this bill, what he can do is that he can refer this bill for the opinion of Supreme Court, ki bhai, hame batao ki bhai, should I sign uh, on this particular bill, this controversial bill or not. Another situation in the same class can be that through precedent, govern, government of the day, if they want to seek opinion of the Supreme Court, the government also can ask opinion of the Supreme Court and these are nothing, these are called presidential references. Right? So, through these presidential references, president will make reference that hey, in so and so course, Supreme Court, hey, I need your advice. Now, if you see, if there is in this kind of case where president is seeking advice on any matter of fact or any matter of law or government is seeking, in that case, Supreme ca Court can refuse, Supreme Court can deny to advise on that kind of matter. Right? But if president is seeking advice on any kind of pre-constitutional treaty or agreement or convention in that case, Supreme Court is bound to give advice. Right? I hope this point, the learning would be clear that in which case president can seek the advice. So, there are two nature of case. In the first, a matter of fact or a matter of law. Through this route, president as well and government as well using this presidential reference can seek the advice. The second is in matter of pre-constitutional treaty agreement and convention, right? In this case, in this pre-constitutional treaty, in this uh, agreement, in this convention, <coughs> so in this second case, of pre-constitutional treaty or convention, president, uh, sorry, Supreme Court is bound to give advice, while in this first case, pre, uh, Supreme Court can refuse to give any kind of advice. If presidential reference is accepted by the Supreme Court, if uh, Supreme Court says that yes, we will advise, in that case, Supreme Court need to constitute the constitution bench and the size of minimum size, what is the minimum size of constitution bench? So, minimum size would be five judges right any advice tender if supreme court is tendering any kind of advice for the against the presidential reference or against the question that has been raised by the president in any of these two cases right those advices are not binding on the president right any advice tendered by supreme court in both the cases is not binding on the president and president can partially or completely ignore it right then article 143 is used sparingly and cannot be used as a political forum to settle political question right so this is from means point of view you can read it right so this was all about the advisory jurisdiction of supreme court the learning here is that the advice tendered by supreme court in case of presidential references that has been made under article 143 that advice is not binding on the president the first learning was that in one case supreme court is binding to give any advice in matters of pre-constitutional treaty in matters of pre-constitutional agreement or convention but in this case uh, supreme court is not bound to give supreme court can simply refuse that hey we are occupied we cannot give you advice on this matter right you have your attorney general you can seek the legal opinion from this attorney general and solicitor general or you do have that battery of advocate right your uh, ravi shankar prasad you do have you do have access 
access to Kapil Sibbal as well. It does not matter if he is from opposition. So you can seek opinion from those people. So in these, this particular class of case, right, press, uh, Supreme Court can refuse to give advice. But on this matter, that is pre-constitutional treaty or agreement or convention, right, that has been designed uh, before the operationalization of constitution. In that case, uh, Supreme Court will have to give its advice. Right. So, I hope this advisory jurisdiction of president uh, would be clear. The last president, uh, sorry, the last presidential reference had been made in this 2G case and in 2G case uh, when 122 licenses including of Uninor had been cancelled by the Supreme Court, a location of these 122 licenses of 2 2G in telecom sector, right. In that case, uh, government had made a presidential reference in which uh, president, uh, this uh, government had directly asked from the Supreme Court itself that whether the Supreme Court could interfere with the policy decisions, right. So, the decision that Supreme Court took against the same decision you are asking from the same institution that is Supreme Court that, hey, can you do this? Means you already have done this. Can you do this? They already have done this, right. So, yes, they can do this. But this was, uh, I mean, this was again a tactic to build pressure on the Supreme Court to extract certain kind of uh, judgment, right. So, that is why that was the president, last presidential reference. So, I hope that uh, this presidential sorry, uh, yes, presidential reference and advisory jurisdiction would also be clear. Now, we are moving into the last leg that is power of judicial review. So, what is this power of judicial review? So, one point is that this power of judicial review, through this power of judicial review, uh, judiciary has been equipped with the power to adjudicate on the acts, the acts that has been passed by the executive means uh, by the Rajya Sabha, Lok Sabha and President. So, the constitutionality of the acts can be checked by this judiciary, right. So, in our parliamentary system where you do have these three organs of the state, although this complete separation of power, doctrine of separation of power is not completely followed, right. We, we, here, what we do have is between the legislature and executive, there is overlap and judiciary is to some extent is separate, right. So, this image is not right, right. Here, the image should be legislature, uh, executive and then judiciary. So, we do not have that uh, complete separation of power, but yes, we do try to. So, the job of legislature is to enact the laws, the job of executive is to implement the laws and the job of judiciary, it is to adjudicate over these laws, to check the constitutionality of the acts or the policy that has been passed by the state legislature and union legislature as well, right. So, along with the union legislature, Supreme Court is empowered to strike down any of the state assembly passed act as well if they are violative of the constitutional principle, right. So, that is the power of judicial review that exercising this power, they can bring down any of the law, any act, any policy of the government which seeks to violate the constitutional ethos of our country, right. So, that is the judicial review power. Where does the judi judicial review power mentioned in the constitution? So, in constitution, there is no clear mention of judicial review. Rather, you have this article 13 of Indian constitution. From where we drive this uh, judicial review feature indirectly, right. So, indirect mention we do have, not mention we can, indirect derivation we have done from this article 13. So, power of judicial review is not mentioned in India's constitution directly, but it flows from article 13. So, this was about power of judicial review as well. So, we have done writ jurisdiction, we have done original jurisdiction, we have done this court of record, we have done appellate jurisdiction, we have done advisory jurisdiction of Supreme Court and power of judicial review. In the next, so three video we already have completed, in the next video we will see the mechanisms, constitutional and judicial mechanism that has been evolved over a period of time that secures independence of the judiciary and there are are one or two topics that is left into the Supreme Court, right. So, with that, uh, our Supreme Court chapter will also be over and we would be able to wrap part 3 uh, of the Lakshmi Kant. So, these are the MCQ that you are supposed to uh, attempt, right. So, this is the first MCQ that was in 1996 that had been asked in, second MCQ 2001, third MCQ, fourth MCQ, fifth MCQ, 
sixth MCQ and seventh MCQ. So, these are the seven MCQ that I expect you to attempt uh, and until we come up with the next video in next two or three days whatever time it will take right. Until then bye bye.